Well, you guys can be seated, man. Thank you for bringing the worship today, man. God inhabits the praises of his people. It's always be great to be able to celebrate him. Appreciate you being here, man. The Uganda team, how about another round of applause for our Uganda team, man, the report they gave. And uh, one more thing, man, all our baptisms, we had four baptisms today, three in our first service, and Celebrate Recovery, our ministry on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, had six baptisms this past Thursday night, man, so, <laughs> man, as they say in West Texas, that had lots of folks getting dunked right there, man, and uh, hey, I want to uh, just make you aware, uh, Cooper mentioned this earlier, this family night, this family launch we have coming up, not this Wednesday, but the one after is for all preschool children, youth, parents, and their students, anybody else that wants to come, we're going to have our student band up here lead worship, a time of prayer, opportunity to meet the staff, you'll be able to meet Cody Turner and his wife, Heather, family pastor, as well as our new spiritual formation pastor, Aaron Gregory and Tristan, they'll be here. So Wednesday night, the 24th, our whole church is invited to come, hang out. I think we're going to have a little Chick-fil-A after that, an opportunity to uh, hang out and see what's going on. So if you're new to Paul Land, great opportunity on the 24th of uh, Wednesday, the 24th. And then in men and women's Bible study start the Wednesday after that on the 31st. You can sign up for those online. And we're in budget time, all right? A year ago, we voted to change our fiscal year from January, December, January to September, August, September. So we're doing a new budget. So if you're a member, you're going to be receiving one of those in the mail to look over. Next week, we'll be voting on it on the 28th, last Sunday of this uh, month. And uh, so just wanted to make you aware of that. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in the weeks to come. But I appreciate you being here. I want to pray for us. Before I do, man, can we just give a little hand clap for our students up here on the first front four rows? Man, I appreciate you guys being here, hanging out with us today. And I want to pray, man, for our students, for our teachers, our staff, our students, and to their parents, man, because uh, school starts. Some of them have already started. Some of them are starting this upcoming week. And uh, so I just want to take a moment to uh, pray for them. Then we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians. All right, so let me pray for us. Father, we want to pray. Man, we want to pray for all the teachers, staff, for the students, their parents. It's a big time of year for them as they go back to school, Lord. And uh, we know this is a significant time, Father. We pray that you give them grace. And uh, I know it's hard those first few days of school. Give the teachers grace and, and uh, patience and give the students just uh, grace as well, God. Be with them. May it be a great student year, Father, uh, for all those in all different areas, whether it's sports or academics or whatever it is, God. We just pray that you would look over uh, each of them uh, this upcoming year. God, you'd bless them. And we thank you for the service that they give to our community. And we pray for each student that's involved, God. Pray you'd just be with them as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you got your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to look at a passage of scripture. We're starting a new series today called Lead, and uh, God's called every one of us to be a leader. It doesn't matter if you're a husband or a wife or a mother or father, God wants you to lead in your family. If you're a student, college student, if you're working somewhere, God wants you to lead where you're at. He wants you to be an example. Uh, if you're a student, wherever you work, God wants to use you to make a difference. He wants you to, for you as a believer to live your life in such a way that other people see that and are interested in this Jesus Christ that you follow. He wants you to lead. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, or maybe you're just thinking about it, man, you need to understand that salvation is a choice. Nobody just gets it given to them. It's a choice, and it always begins with God. God is the one that initiates, and we, re we respond, all right? God's the initiator. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's the gift of God. And God's gift to you is to reveal himself to you in a way that you can understand. And when he does that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it's your choice whether you want to respond by faith or not, right? And when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you understand, you need to understand what you have. Jesus Christ didn't save you so he could somehow tweak your life. He didn't come and live the perfect life and die on the cross and be resurrected so he could take the life that you're currently living and just make it better. No, no, man, he, he came to do something completely new. He came to give you a new life. As it says in John 10, abundant life, right? He came to do something completely new. He didn't come just to tweak your life. He came to do something radically new in your life. And the reason is because outside of Jesus Christ, we're all spiritually dead, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, you know, in the, in the sins and trespasses and sin in you, which you used to walk, you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you used to walk before you gave your life 
to Jesus Christ. So don't think that if you're a non-believer that somehow you can work your way to God or you're a good enough person to somehow get there when you die because you can't because you're spiritually dead, right? Jesus didn't come to make, take good people and make them better. Jesus came to take dead people and to give them new life. And if Jesus has done that in your life, man, he's given you life. He's given you the ability to lead, to make a difference in other people's lives. And therefore, it doesn't matter who you are, God can use you. In other words, we live in a world, when we talk about leadership, we're always thinking about power or position or money or popularity, and that's not who God uses. God uses people who are simply willing to follow him. Because it's not about all that, it's about the Spirit of God working in you. And so when you look at this passage in 1 Corinthians today, written by the Apostle Paul, Paul was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever seen, man. He, he influenced the world, perhaps other than Jesus Christ, more than any person that's ever lived. He changed Western civilization by his teaching and his books. He was one of the greatest leaders, but even he knew that it wasn't based on his power or his smarts or what he did, but it was based on the power of God. Therefore, God can use anybody. And that's really what he says to us in his first Corinthians passage. It begins like this, verse 26. He starts off, brothers and sisters. You're, you're, I'm in the CSB. It might say brethren. Anytime you see brothers, sisters, brethren, he's talking to believers. So he says, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth, Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, a a righteousness sanctification and redemption in order that as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the Lord now Paul was a Pharisee before he got saved that meant that he was probably rich he was very powerful he was super smart right he probably had the entire Old Testament memorized at a very young age but he knew that as he led and what he accomplished wasn't based upon himself but it was based upon the power of God And he goes on to tell us in chapter 2, he says, When I came to you, brothers, now he's talking about the church in Corinth. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God, which is the gospel, to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. He said, when I came to you, I didn't didn't try to wow you with all my preaching. I just tried to come in the Spirit's power, preaching nothing but Jesus and Him crucified. Now, you might ask, what's Paul talking about? And by the grace of God, we not only have the book of 1 St. Corinthians that talks about the church in Corinth, but we also have the book of Acts. And Acts tells us what was going on in Paul's life when he first came to the town of Corinth. It's recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 17. He was on what's known as his second missionary journey, and uh, he'd already gone on one. He left from the town of Antioch, which is in modern-day Turkey, and on his second missionary journey, he left. He went to a town called Derby, which always reminds me of a hat, and then from there, he went to a town called Lystra, where he met a guy named Timothy. Perhaps you're familiar with him. Timothy made a decision to travel with Paul, so it became Paul and Timothy now traveling. And they wanted to go straight west across Turkey. And the next country, it wasn't called Turkey back then, it was called Asia. He wanted to go into Asia, kind of where Ephesus is located. But it's recorded for us, and this is a significant passage of Scripture. This is Acts chapter 16, verse 6. They went through the area of the region of Galatia. This is Paul and Timothy and the others that were traveling with him. For they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They wanted to go into Asia, but it says that somehow they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit from going into Asia. And so when they came to Mysa, they tried to go into Bithynia, which is north. So they were going west. They they couldn't go west any longer. So they turned and they went north. They were going towards this area called Bithynia, which is up by the Black Sea. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So passing through, they went 
all the way to Troas, and during the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, come on over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we, Lucas now with him, immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This might not seem like a significant passage of scripture, but really it's one of the main turning points in the book of Acts, the book of the whole Bible, because in one step, Paul took the, the gospel from the Middle East to Europe. When he went to Macedonia, the, the gospel went to Europe, and from Europe, it obviously came to America. It was a world-changing moment. But the point is, he wanted to go to Asia, but he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit. He wanted to go somewhere else. He wanted to go to Bithynia, but he was stopped by the Spirit of Jesus, which is one of the same, same person. The question is, how did the Holy Spirit do that? How did the Holy Spirit keep Paul from going into Asia? Was there... Did he get sick? Was there a blockade? Was there a war going on in Asia? Did some still small voice within him go, hey, bro, don't go that. Don't go there. We really don't know how the Holy Spirit spoke to him, except we do know that Paul obeyed. And, and this is really what I want to say to you. If you want to be a leader, you have to be willing to be led. If you're going to be a leader, you have to be willing to be led. And that doesn't just go for the spiritual matters. This goes for secular and a secular business. Say you've got a secular job out there and you're working really hard and there's somebody above you that's your boss and the whole time you're thinking, I could do a job better than him. I should be doing that. He should be doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm better than him. And you start trying to think how you're going to somehow displace him so you can be promoted. Uh, the best thing you can do is just understand that you can't be a leader until you're willing to be Led. You can't be in a position of authority until you understand authority and you're under authority. The very best thing you can do is simply do serve where you're at and let God take care of the rest on your promotion. You cannot be a leader unless you understand, unless you're willing to be led. And in spiritual matters, this is the key thing. What does the Holy Spirit want you to do and are you willing to do it or not? Because if the Holy Spirit asks you to do something and you're obedient to do that, then you get into the power of God range of your life where God can do things in your life that you can never accomplish. But as long as it's you trying to do it under your own power, when you try to do God's work under your own power, that's religion. And religion has no power. The Spirit of God, on the other hand. But the only way you can get in on the Spirit of God is to be willing to be led because He's going to ask you to do things that appears to be foolish in the eyes of the world. And that's hard to do, do something that the world says is foolish, right? In other words, there's a passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus refers to a guy. He makes this statement about a man, I have never seen such great faith in anyone, even in all of Israel. Jesus only referred to two people as having great faith. One of them was a Roman centurion. The other one was a Canaanite woman. You'd think he would say that about the apostles, but to the apostles, he's like, oh, ye of little faith. But in this particular case, in Matthew 8, a Roman centurion had a servant that was sick. He sent some servants to get Jesus. Would you come heal my servant? And Jesus, because he loves us, went to heal the servant. But as he was going, he, he sent, this guy sent some more servants and said, look, Jesus, you don't come, have to come all the way to my house. For I'm a man, this is Matthew chapter 8, verse 9, for I'm a man under authority, and I'm a man that commands other people. And I tell people to go, and they go. And I say, come, and they come. And I say, do this, and they do it. You don't have to come to my house. Jesus, just say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. It's a great act of faith, man. In fact, Jesus responds, man, I think that's great faith. May it be done as you ask. And his servant was healed on the spot. Jesus never having gone there. My point is, the way it's recorded is, this guy doesn't say, Jesus, hey, don't worry about it, don't come to my house, because I'm a man of authority. I say stuff and it happens. You're a man of authority. You know what he says? Because I'm a man under authority. You'll never really understand authority unless you're willing to put yourself under authority. You'll never really understand and get in on the power of God unless you're willing to be led. This is the root issue. Nobody wants to do it. Everybody wants to be in charge on the little throne of their life. I'm in charge. Don't be telling me what to do, especially West Texas folk. Don't be telling me what to do, man. Don't be telling me how to vote, where to go, what to do. Don't be trying to, oh, you pry that out of my dead cold, you know, all that stuff in West Texas, right? This is the issue. You'll never get in on the move of God unless you're willing to do what God wants to do, which is foolishness in the eyes of the world. 
You'll never be a spiritual leader unless you're willing to be led. Here's the Apostle Paul. He goes, he gets this vision. He, I'm not going to Asia. I'm, I'm going go to I'm gonna go to Macedonia. He has to cross the Aegean Sea. He gets over there. First house he gets to is this lady named Lydia. You know this. Lydia is the first convert in Europe. So we have a woman, first convert in Europe, the, a trader in, in purple dye or purple cloth. And then he meets this little slave girl that's demon-possessed, and he frees her from the demon, but it makes the owner so mad. They have Paul arrested. This is in the town of Philippi. They have him flogged, beaten, thrown in jail. That night, an earthquake hits the jail. He gets set free, but before he leaves, he leads the jailer to the Lord. So that's the three converts he had in Philippi. He had a woman, a slave girl, and a Roman jailer. The least likely people in the whole world to get saved in Europe are those three dudes. He has to leave that town. He goes to Thessalonica. He, he preaches there, and, and, and he, the people get so freaked out, they start a riot. A mob forms. They're going to kill Paul. has to flee for his life. He winds up going to Athens, which is the big city, you know, the big city in, in Macedonia, Athens. He goes to Athens, and he preaches famous sermons recorded for us in Scripture to the unknown God. It's an incredible sermon. Think about Athens, he didn't really see any spiritual fruit. He didn't plant a church there. He only had a few people get saved. In fact, he planted a church in Philippi. We have the book written to it, the book of Philippians. We have a church planted in, Thessalon in Thessalonica, the first of Thess Thessalonians. Everybody, anybody ever read the book of the first Athens? No, because he didn't have any spiritual fruit there. He leaves Athens and he comes to Corinth. And you know what he says when he gets to Corinth? I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Why? Because what I did in Athens didn't work. It's like Paul tried to do God's way, his way. He tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with those philosophers in Athens. He tried to convince them with the wisdom of the world that they should give their life to Jesus, and it didn't work. And by the time he got to Corinth, he was all beat up. Man, I've been thrown in jail. I've been flogged. haven't seen doing anything. I went to Athens, tried to explain to them philosophically what it meant to follow Jesus, and nobody even got saved. Things changed when he came to Corinth because he said, when I came to Corinth, man, I just decided to preach nothing but Jesus and Jesus crucified. What's Jesus and Jesus crucified mean? It's a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? The Messiah died. Christ was crucified. What? The Messiah? No, the Messiah is all about power and prestige. He's, he's going to get rid of the Romans. It was a stumbling block to the Jews. It was foolishness to the Greek. You're going to tell me that your God died? And we're supposed to believe in that, and that's going to save us? It was, it was foolishness. But here's the thing. You see, the, the world's leader, the, the 